short, this very large uh, Canadian insurance holding company called Fairfax Holdings. And the reason that we're short is because through al financial alchemy and often off-balance sheet debt, it's overstating its book value by close to 30%. And that's a reasonably conservative estimate. How, how do you think it's overstating book value and why? Sure. So the reason why is that this company is known as the Berkshire Hathaway of Canada. So since it's almost since its inception, it's tried to create this mythos about it that the chairman controlling shareholder is Warren Buffett. And so they focus on compounding the book value per share. But they, ta they set this target of 15 percent long term uh, CAGR uh, for the book value per share. But the reality is they haven't been able to get anywhere near that since the financial crisis. So what they've begun doing, especially after this one difficult acquisition in 2017, they've begun engaging in all of these transactions that are often value destructive and require them to lay out cash or take on off balance sheet debt. But these transactions produce these paper profits. So they've been able to pad their book value per share, but it's costing real cash, I mean, either now or in the future, and it's 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 actually completely non-substantive. The the one example that you lay out up front on this is Recipe, which is a chain of restaurants that went public in 2015. You say that that Fairfax consistently overvalued its equity in Recipe and then ended up taking it private. You want to walk through that? Sure. So that's just one example, and that's one of the I guess simpler examples of what it does. So for years, it carried this investment well above what the trading, the, the market price was. But at some point, it seems like the, the difference between reality and carrying value was too great. So they spent real cash just to take the entire thing private. And they still have it marked well above where it should be. Uh, because from the financials that you can still see, its performance continues to deteriorate over time. So that's, that's, one, of the more, that's one of the more straightforward ways in which they've done this. But they've also done these convoluted transactions, like with something called Riverstone, where they face a Canadian pension and they basically take on what's really debt, but they call it equity, and it's high cost. They pay you know, substantial dividends usually on these transactions, um, and that's part of how they're destroying value. But by structuring something like a joint venture, um, what's really a loan as a joint venture, they keep this debt off balance sheet, and then they're able to take these paper gains when they buy the shares back, which is basically the repayment of the loan. So it can go from the pretty anodyne, like you just mentioned with Recipe, to the highly complex, like with Riverstone. Carson, this is not the first time that this company has been a target of short sellers. If you go back to before 2007, this company was dogged for years by a group of hedge funds. It actually sued a number of them, including Stephen Cohen, uh, going after them and saying, look, they were trying to uh, take down the company, basically saying it was racketeering. What makes you think that this is going to be different because the company survived that? Well, I think that the, the GFC probably actually helped uh, Fairfax. And I don't know this part of the history very well, but I think that Fairfax was positioned well, might have even been short uh, the subprime securities going into the GFC. But yeah, what happened before, from what I can glean, is that the short thesis really revolved around the, the reserves in the various insurance subsidiaries and that they didn't think they were adequately reserved. I mean, we're not looking at the insurance subsidiaries. This is all basically at consolidated level, the accounting, is abysmal, basically. It's highly misleading, a lot of smoke and mirrors. I mean, just to kind of put it in context here, since that big acquisition in 2017, which seemed to be the company saying, hey, we need to try to grow the book value, since that acquisition, about 60% of the growth in book value per share has come through these non-substantive, like uh, smoke and mirrors type transactions. So that's, that's a different thesis from what we saw back in the early 2000s and for you know when uh, when the company ended up suing everybody they, i think they, there were some other like, third they have a long standing there. auditor pwc toronto are you suggesting the auditors aren't doing their job what's really funny about that and this is the first time i've seen this is that um, pwc actually states in the audit report that it's unable to determine when it started auditing this company like it's been so it's been fairfax's auditor for so long it's like it's almost as though there's no record keeping but there is a real governance point here that we didn't discuss with in our report and you've got 
two children of the CEO or controlling shareholder who are on the board of directors. And as far as the auditor goes, that's been there so long that you know they can't even remember how long they've been there. A uh, former head of PwC Canada also sits on the board of Fairfax now. And so when we see that kind of arrangement, that's very reminiscent of companies we've reported on in the past, like NMC Health, where they had a former audit part, senior audit partner on the board who, you know, seemingly kind of helped lull the auditor to sleep there. Same thing with Sinoforest. So it's not a good thing, and it doesn't surprise us when you have this really long-standing relationship with the auditor, and it's so close that they even have a former senior executive from the auditor sitting on the company's board. Carson, we are reaching out to the company to try and get comment from them, but I, I don't want to not dig into what you're doing, too. You're coming on to talk about this because you have a short position. How big is your short position? How much do you expect the stock to drop? What would cause you to close out that, that short position? If the stock's down 10 percent, do you close it out? No, I mean, not... You know, so first of all, we don't discuss the size of our short positions. Well, and, I, I, we're giving you the opportunity to come on and talk about this. I think we need to be a little up front about the idea that you have skin in the game on this, too. If the stock goes down, you could go, you could benefit. What would cause you to close oh, yeah, out the short no, position? I, we definitely, look, we definitely, there's absolutely, like everybody who shows up to work every day on Wall Street, there's a profit motive in us being short and us talking about it. But the thing about our incentive, you know, it's kind of funny because... We often get this pushback, like, well, you know, you're biased, so why should we listen to you, a short seller? You know, the thing is, when we talk about the company's 15% CAGR and the fact that they haven't even come close to that in years, I mean, per their numbers, without any of our adjustments, their CAGR since the GFC is about 9%. No sell side analyst has, has figured this out. I was talking to a credit analyst the other week about Fairfax, and I said, hey, you know, I run, I've run the numbers. They don't CAGR at that. And this is after the credit analyst was calling uh, Prem Watts of the Warren Buffett of Canada. And this is the Berkshire Hathaway of Canada. So nobody's doing the work. So, okay. yes, I have a significant incentive to talk about this. But I also have the incentive to ask questions that evidently nobody else is doing. Asking questions is completely fair. But if you think their book value should be about 20 percent lower than it is right now, what do you think the fair valuation for the price is? I'm just trying to get at where, where you would say, okay, forget it. I'm going to close my short because it's back down to with what I think is fair valuation. So as a, first of all, it shouldn't trade a premium to book. When you're manipulating book value like this, you shouldn't. So the book value should be about 20% lower, maybe a little bit more. There are other areas that we'd like to dig into uh, going forward. And then it should be at more like 0.8, maybe 1.0 book. But in terms of when we close, because we're active as short sellers, a lot of times it comes down to, well, have we said everything we can say? Is there, is there more juice that we can get? Uh, do we think that an upcoming earnings announcement is likely to be, you know, likely to shed more light on the story or not? So it's, you know, it's, it's difficult to say. We don't set price targets internally and say, once it hits that, we're covering. It's really about the, the uptake of the information and the assimilation of it in the market. All right, Carson, I want to thank you for your time again. Uh, we are reaching out to Fairfax Financial to try and get their opinion on this, too. But Carson Block, thank you. Thank you. And good morning. And